Hey, welcome to the Jordan Rich Show here on WBZ News Radio 1030. It is a shade after midnight. It's raining lightly. A little more rain ahead of it our way, but we can handle it. And it's great to be with you. Hello to Casey O'Donnell in Studio A. This is the Jordan Rich Show all through the night. And the number is 617 254 1030 or 888 929 1030. Check us out on Facebook, facebook.com slash Jordan Rich Show. And uh, one more time to be obnoxious, my name, jordanrich.com. All right, already I said it, if you want to find out what's happening on the show and connect with us live. Uh, first off, a shout-out to Kenny and Kate. They got married last night at the Providence Muse, uh, Library, Providence Public Library, beautiful venue, and uh, very close friends of mine, and uh, congratulations to them, and wonderful seeing all the family members. And uh, here I am, back on the air at midnight after being at a wedding all day. Isn't that amazing? Look who's here, one of my favorite people, uh, Justin Locke, who's a Certainly one of the smartest men in the world. Well, you can't look who's here. It's radio. You're going to have to hear who's here. Okay. Let me point to that chair over there, and it could be no a theory of the mind. You could not even exist. You could be ethereal in That's nature. true. Or we could subtitle it, but then people couldn't see that either. That's I don't true. know how we're going to do this. Justin Locke is here none, nonetheless, and occasionally they let you out or let you in, depending on how you want to look at it, to co-host <laughs> this extravaganza with me. It's great to be here. Thanks it's great to me. see you, my friend. You're always up and about with something interesting. Of course, Justin has a long career in music, working with the BSO of the Boston Pops. He's, uh, we'll talk about that. He's got one, two, three already books that are mm -hmm. out there, right? Yep. With another one we're going to talk about on the way. Fantastic. And, uh, and a whole lot of thoughts on life and how we live it and all that kind of stuff. So we're going to hang out together tonight. Fantastic. And uh, speaking of things that are being delivered, no baby yet. I'm expecting a grandchild at any moment. Well, any minute? Not any minute, but maybe any day, maybe later in the week, or maybe it's already happened. I don't know. Well, these babies, they're very inconsistent. They don't give you any, yeah, they basically decide. Yeah, I mean, they, don't they have like a calendar? Or, you know, it's the last thing you do before you pop out is, is decide when you're going to put, and then everything else is done for you for the first five or six years. Not bad. Oh, there you go. Anyway, great to see you. Let's talk about what you have in your ba basket of tricks here on the bookstore circuit, Real Men Don't Rehearse. That was the first one? That was my first real book that I self-published. That was, a, And actually, this is the 10-year anniversary. And, and, and this is kind of a, a homecoming for me because after I self-published it, I didn't know how I was going to promote it. And then Paul Sullivan sat in that chair yes. and had me on for two hours in prime time. And I sold out the first edition thanks to WBZ. Thank you very and much for we, that. And then we brought you back to do it again. And it's, it's still a perennial bestseller. Well, I don't know if you're aware of this <laughs> show, uh, Mozart in the Jungle. Uh, came out on Amazon. They're making their own TV shows, and they mm -hmm. made this series. And this was kind of my competition was this book, Amazon, uh, I'm sorry, Mozart in the Jungle. And it was an oboe player in, in New York City who wrote a, a, a memoir. It wasn't a comedy book. It was more about sex and drugs. And they Amazon made a 10-hour a, a miniseries out of it. And lo and behold, after 10 years, this came on, and this just sparked all this interest in classical music and i had the biggest sale month ever in february it was all you know kindle sales amazing Isn't that a beautiful thing oh you, i love promotion equals sale yes free Absolutely. promotion is wonderful well let me promote your other works getting in touch with your inner rich kid mm -hmm. and principles of applied stupidity that's kind of a dark horse book that you know occasionally a uh, people who are ceos need to read that book it's not for people who don't don't want to think too much because it really kind of takes your whole concept of life and turns it on its head well, that's why we love having you here well thank you turn thank life you. on its head and you're working on a new one i thought we'd start with that and I'll go uh, into it. Oh, okay. focus on what what it is that your your mind is kicking around these days well you know i've been you know trying to develop a, a career as a speaker and a coach and uh, i write a lot of articles uh, and i'm fascinated with the concept of improvementology and if you get online i mean how many diets are there uh, on this planet and yet we're the most obese o adult cohort in the human history mm -hmm. uh just the sheer number of speakers advisors coaches consultants seminars on leadership and I sit down and say, you know, Eisenhower never read these books. You know, Romulus and Remus never read Good to Great. You know, they, they, they managed to somehow do it without the help of these books. And my question is, really, at some point, when are we going to sit down and ask, is this stuff really netting us anything? Do we have better leadership now than when we went to the moon or did the D-Day invasion? I, I, 
I, I, I, I, to me, my own personal opinion is it really hasn't gotten any better. So what's, where, what's the failure here? And, if, if, and so if I'm going to ask people to pay me money to get up and speak about leadership, I don't want to be one more person uh, mouthing a, a mm. platitude saying, well, you know, get out there and, you know, live your dream and, and focus on, because if it doesn't work, what's the use of it? What was, is the use of where it? Where was I recently, and I heard a funny bit about a bunch of executives and they, uh, or anybody in business, and they hire some guy who climbed Mount Everest to come in and inspire them to be. Yeah. And, and you try yeah. to say, well, what does climbing Mount Everest have to do with selling more widgets on Tuesday? But <laughs> People think that there's that that inspiration that we can glean from. I, I guess suppose it is kind of a cool thing to have a mountain climber in your midst, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's I call it these thought vacations. But my question is, well, how about one of these executives uh, going and speaking to like fifty Everest mountain climbers? I mean, can't they, you know, inspire <laughs> them? I mean. Uh, conductors run around, you know, giving lectures to pipe fitters. And I go, well, why don't we have a pipe fitter come and talk to 100 conductors? How is it that we have a monopoly on that? And, it, it, you know, the, the, the geometry of it, the math of it doesn't add up. Uh, I love your, your take on the diet thing. I have a pretty strict rule about not, and I interview a lot of authors, about not interviewing and putting on air on this program uh, the latest diet fad book guys even mm -hmm. if they have an md after the name because of the fact that it's a fad i mean everything that's a quote diet of the week is a diet of the week and uh you know where's doc well he's dead mr atkins there he's mm -hmm. gone but where are all these diet guru experts if they were the right ones at the right time would everyone should be thin by now Yes, and this applies to just about <laughs> all of these advice books. If, if, it, if that's a good book, you shouldn't need to read another one. And they come out with another book every two years, mm -hmm. you know, the updated version of, you know, and I don't want to mention you know, specific authors, but you, we all know these fad books. Mm -hmm. It sold two million copies, and uh, it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. And what I really hate is when people come up to you with one of these books and say, you should read this book. It'll change your life. And there's this subtle implication that your life really needs to be changed. You know, they don't overtly say that but i i'm always a little put off by that i don't know i mean you know, is it really up to you to tell me i need to change my life well it, it, that's a whole cottage more than a cottage industry it's 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 a oh, huge, huge industry uh, it's huge industry and, and the whole idea of quote consulting and i know you do some consulting i do consulting but in terms of there's something wrong with you i can fix you uh if you don't have that ability to convince somebody there is something wrong with them, then you're out of business. So you've exactly. Got to, I, you've got to do that. I call that the poison in the mashed potatoes <laughs> sales sales technique. Mm -hmm. You know, I got a vial here of a poison antidote, and I'll, what, what, what did it give me for it? Well, you, don't, you won't give me anything for it. But if I say, well, you know, I just poisoned your mashed potatoes, you know, oh, well, now what do you pay for the antidote? Mm. But you got to poison the mashed potatoes. for you got to shame people and tell them there's something wrong with them in order for them to buy the fix for that's wrong. So you're the guy in this new book and all the other projects and talking and speaking that you're doing, you're the guys looking at these, quote, improvement experts mm -hmm. and wondering how many of them are really just full of it. Uh, the number is, is, is depressingly high. <laughs> it's, it's like conductors. You know, I played with a lot of conductors, and it was like 97% of them had no clue. Mm. And they thought they did. This was hard. That, that made it hard to improve them because they had already presumed that they knew what they was. And, you know, someone like John Williams, I love talking about this guy because he never did anything. He just stood on the podium and the whole orchestra was like a Doberman on a leash, you know, seeing a rabbit. I mean, he was just ready to go, mm. eager to go. And he never said anything. He just was like there. He's just there. He's yeah. just there. Raise like, the baton and everybody it, just... It didn't even have to do that. It would just say, <laughs> you know, okay, you know, you know, Star Wars, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and the, the energy that would come out, I said, how does he do that? I was fascinated with it. And then other people, it wasn't talent. It wasn't talent. There were people who had all the talent and training in the world, and the orchestra just hated them, just hated them. And when I got out of that world, I said, oh, okay, I'm going to share my knowledge. This is how naive I was. I'm going to share this wonderful knowledge I had in orchestras, right? Because, mm. you know, oh, the maestro must know. And I found out it's everywhere. This, and, and there are great conductors of, of business. There are great conductors of, of companies. And there's ones that are, are ter terrible. And the advice 
well, I'm, I'm meandering here, but we really have this industrial mindset overlaying everything, that people are machines, and if we just replace the alternator, it'll run like a top. I love the fact, uh, the older I get, the more I love this, the, the fact that there are imperfection rules and that things that are not supposed to be great are great. Things that mm -hmm. people are, who are supposed to just knock it out of the park, and I'll use the Red Sox current team as an example— they're on paper supposed to be number one in batting. They suck, if I may say so myself. <laughs> yeah. They lost again tonight. And it's just, gr I love that. Maybe I'm a fan of entropy, as George Carlin was. I love the fact that things don't always go the way they should be. And that's f in terms of politics, in terms of science, certainly in terms of art, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Because the world would be a boring place if it... It well, it's, it's Langley and the Wright brothers. There's a guy who had, you know, 80, in those days, dollars, $50 million to build an airplane, spent it all, and the thing went right off the roof into the <laughs> river. <laughs> and <laughs> then guys, you got Orville and Wilbur. Yeah, a couple of bicycle guys from Dayton, and they figured it out. Yeah. You know, that, that it's not supposed to work that way, but it does. We're going to be talking with this very intriguing gentleman uh, throughout the night. Uh, we have a couple of guests popping in and out. Actually, one such guest, uh, Elon Elon, Elon Musk, right? Uh, not him, but the fellow who's written a book about him. He's one of the most intriguing sort of technologists and thinkers of his day, and he doesn't follow the game plan that no. people want him to follow. So we'll talk with him. Uh, Joseph Finder will be a guest as well. Great friend of the program. Joe Finder writes these amazing thrillers. The latest one is The Fixer, and boy, is it a Boston-based book that anybody will love. But we're here with Justin Locke, and you are in for the night, right? I'm here till till the till the cows come home. We're going to be talking about. I I introduced you to synesthesia. We're going to talk about that tonight. Excellent, I because love it, it relates directly to your vast research. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, WBZ. Uh, the number is six one seven two five four ten thirty. This is not repeat. Not uh, it never is an ordinary talk show. So be just beware. I mean, strap yourselves in. We'll continue in just a memento. Oh, now listen to me. Listen, listen. Are you listening to me? Welcome. Great to have you on board tonight. And as we enter into today, we enter summer 2015, also Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to all. Here on the Jordan Rich Show, it's WBZ 617-254-1030. Anytime you want to jump on. My guest is my good friend Justin Locke, author of several books. He's working on a new one. Uh, he's a musician. He's a, uh, a business expert. He gives talks on all kinds of subjects and uh, principles of applied stupidity, getting in touch with your inner rich kid. Real Men Don't Rehearse, just three of the titles, and a new one coming out, and we've been touching on that a little bit. So, yeah, well, you, you just throw yourself at the mercy of the world and try to come up with a reason for everything. I, I do. I like to find out, well, it's my musical training. I went at this, this uh, you know, I went through all these music schools, and I was in a position where I really wanted to get better, and I was willing to do whatever it took to do that. I had made the commitment. And I would go to music schools and say, teach me. Here, here's $17,000. Teach me how to be good enough to play in the Boston Symphony. Like, well, uh, you know, read this book, and we've got a curriculum. No, no, I want to be able to pass this audition. How do you do that? And a, a lot of it just, just didn't work. And I finally, f there was always someone who came along and said, oh, Justin, here is the fundamental. Here's the one thing that you do need to know. And in, one, in that case, it was play your scales and arpeggios till you're blue in the face. That, mm. It was so simple. I didn't, but I had to pay you know, massive amounts of money to find a guy who was just a fellow <laughs> student who mentioned that to me one day in the cafeteria? Changed my life. Simplification. Yes, it I has, mean if you if you down to boil, three things. Uh, uh, well, yeah. um, come on. Yeah. Well, uh, three things. Well, okay. So if, the Wright brothers conquered the air with three axes of control. You need the ailerons and the rudder and the tail. Mm -hmm. And no one else figured that out. They said, and that, but the, every single plane built ever since then is those three things. Every living thing. Uh, in history, is, has four DNA molecules. I mean, your liver, your eyeball, my liver, my, I, I mean, to design a liver with just four little things, I mean, that, and then, you know, every, there's millions of colors, there's only three primary, mm. and the universe, and then the fractals, you discover that, oh, 
every, and on an atom, matter itself is electrons, protons, and neutrons. Sure. So yeah. everything just, the universe always comes, <clears throat> and that's what I'm always looking for. Tell me the fundamental of this. What's the fun, and this is the problem is people say, oh, well, matter is, oh, there's billions and billions. No, no, no. I want to know what it's made yeah, out of. Yeah, boil it down to the simplest, and that's usually the, 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 the direct route to the answer. But what we were yes. talking earlier about people a, a huge industry in the world uh, creating more complicated issues t so that they can be the ones with the answers and they never give you the answers. That's oh, no. The, the well, if you, if, you, if you have the answer, <laughs> I mean, this is what, this is what happened to me as a bass player. Once I figured this out, I didn't t need to take lessons anymore. And this is bad for the economy when mm. people stop saying, well, I don't need to take lessons with you anymore. Well, why should I give you the answer if I just sort of dangle it over here? then you'll constantly pay me. Yes, my boy. You see, you have to come back for sessions at uh, $250 exactly. per hour so I can continue to analyze exactly. you. But, Doc, <laughs> I feel great. No, you're, you may feel great, but you're not great. You must come. I mean, that's the Exactly. That's I mean, if, if I said to you, all right, I can fix all of your psychological problems, everything, all, all your, your issues with your mother and, and you know, your yeah, yeah, anxiety, it's going to cost you, you know, $8,000. But I, I can do it in, like, 20 minutes. No one's going to pay that. But if I if I get your whole salami one slice at a time, you know, a hundred <laughs> bucks a week for like four years, people are happy to get on the installment plan. Yeah, you're right about that, man. It's so true. And 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 I I, I think what's that say? You know, forced obsolescence. We don't want to sell ourselves out of business. We don't want to you know be no. so good. I say that we. I'm not suggesting you and me or people listening necessarily, but so many want to create a reason for their existence, and mm -hmm. that's just continuing to uh, to bring problems to bear that may not even be there. Yeah, well, you know, Jonas Salk put himself out of business. He cured polio, and then, well, he had to go get a job, you know, I don't know, cleaning typewriters or something because I, he you – know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Thank I do, you very much, Jonas. I, here's, I, here's your check. <laughs> as somebody who does a lot of work in charity for, for medical – charities uh you always hear this we hope we never have to be here and we don't have to have another fundraiser and the, and i mean that people sincerely believe that and i, I do too mm -hmm. but uh, think about the impact of that because if you take away the disease and mm -hmm. the cause you've taken away uh, a third of the the city's economy let's say in yep. trying to fight that i'm glad you said it not me well you know, i, I, if, I if, if you cure something at, at hey you know all the people have been working on the cure suddenly what are you going to do with them They're, what are you going to do it's like when the war ends you got to demobilize you know and all these people they got to find another job right so there's i'm always suspicious of people who if they succeed they will be out of work hmm. there's always kind of a conflict there and i'm like uh you know i don't know if that's going to work or not for me but it's uh, yeah it, it is it, it is a problem and you end you up you yeah. said earlier, you know, I love this term you coined, the improvementologist. Mm -hmm. uh, why is it that we look at products and we take a look on the shelf at, let's say, Tylenol, okay? We don't buy Tylenol. We have to buy extra strength Tylenol. I've always wondered this. Extra strength as opposed to what? The ordinary? It's not good enough. So why would I even bother? And by the way, can you find regular Tylenol? I don't even know. Do I they don't even know. make the well, stuff? I, 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 I always want to see old and not improved, but all I get is new and improved. New and improved. Yes. Do you know what that tells me? You guys were selling me a, an inferior product yes, last week. Exactly. Oh, I hate Boy, it. Why am when I cynical? Why am somebody. I so cynical? Because well, I'm here. here. <laughs> I think we should call this the cynical hour, but with, but intelligently cynical. Intelligently, I'm not I, because at the heart of this, I'm not trying to just trash people. I'm trying to say because I had such a problem in in, in many fields, both as a book writer and as a dancer, and as a especially as a bass player. I wanted help, and a lot of people held out false hope to me, and I ended up spending a lot of time and money running down dark alleys of people who told me they had the answer, but they didn't. And I'm trying to say to people, hey, you know, let's get, let, let's break this down to what actually works. Mm. What, what works? I'm definitely thinking that there's a whole contingent of, of the population concerned about higher education, being able to support it and wondering, why are we doing this? Why are we, for, oh, for a is... great number of young people, why are we putting them into debt by the tune of 200 grand plus interest to end up flipping burgers, and there's nothing wrong with that, but to end up 
without a job after four years, without a, some direction after many years. Yes, a liberal arts education is is brilliant. It's wonderful. But uh, why why is it costing so much? And is it really worth it? Oh, well, I can <laughs> I, I have an answer for that if you want to hear it. Well, you can start. you got a minute and a half, and then we'll okay. go continue well, after the break. College has traditionally been an entry into the upper upper crust. This was how, you know, rich people, you know, sent their sons to college. And it was four years, and it's where you go, and you would meet uh, a young lady or young man of the, of the opposite sex in your social class. And that was really the purpose of it. And it was always something that it, it, it embodied a higher level of, 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 of citizenship, really. And this became sort of like, well, this is the way to do it. And after World War II, when we had the GI Bill and everybody was going to go to college, uh, and it, it made sense at that time because there were an awful lot of skills that nobody had because they were all farm kids and mm -hmm. they had to go learn just basic stuff. Uh, but then you introduce this whole concept of uh, uh, government guaranteed loans. So there's just like this unlimited tap of, of loan money. And so I, my brother has this phrase, he says, the predators adapt to the food source. <laughs> and, you know, hey, if, okay, if we can charge 10000 a year for tuition, but we can get twenty, if this student has the capacity to pay that, well, why not charge twenty and come mm. up with some reason to do it? There's no motivation to drive it down. And the other real problem is that a college degree is a de facto citizenship paper. There's any job beyond minimum wage. You have to have that union dues. All right, stand by. We've got much more to talk about with this rather fascinating chap. Our good friend Justin Locke will continue. It's 1231 and we'll be back after this update. WBZ News Radio 1030. Jordan Richo continues. A uh, note to one listener and probably many others who called in. We had a, an author, we had several guests last night, and the author, Leo, I'm sorry, Lou Urenek, U-R-E-N-E-C-K, a uh, professor at BU, and the book that uh, somebody just asked about is called The Great Fire, One America's Mission, One American's Mission to Rescue Victims of the 20th Century's First Genocide. It is an amazing story, one that I never knew about, so that's a, the title for those uh, people who are wondering, The Great Fire by Lou Uranek, okay? And in studio, we've got uh, Justin Locke. <laughs> he just told me off air. Uh, this is great, a great catchphrase. What's bothering Justin Locke today? You really are uh, not a curmudgeon, really. What are you? No, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I, I, I'm conscious. I, I just, well, for example, I mean, in The Wizard of Oz, you've got a wicked witch of the, e of, the wet, of the east, right, that gets killed by the house. The house right? lands on the wicked yeah, witch of the east. and there's a wicked witch of the west. Mm -hmm. And she gets offed. And then there's a good witch of the north. You're asking about the south. Where is that Yeah, witch? where's the witch of the south? Okay, very good. That, that bothers me. <laughs> I really want to know. All right. Uh, that's, that's a good one we can follow up on. You know, I mean, maybe someone, I, I didn't Google it, you mm. know, but it's, that, that's the kind of question. I put this on Facebook all the time, and I drive people crazy with that's my okay. questions. That's okay. That's okay. So, yeah, I, 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 like to, I like to ask these questions because otherwise you end up, you know, it's like new Tylenol. Where's the old Tylenol? I, I ask that question. All right. Simplification. Uh, example. Any instruction booklet I get with any new gadget, why does it have to be, seriously, yes. why does it have to be so, in my estimation, small printish, which doesn't even a word, why does it have to be written and directed at, at uh, you know, somebody who's not necessarily that tech savvy? And, I mean, it's not, it, it, once you know how to use something, it's not hard. It's learning to read the instructions. Well, I have a theory. Oh, oh, of course you do. Of course I do. Is that the people who are writing this, we teach people this, this shame state that what you are is no good. So you have to obfuscate that and make it super, super complicated. You know, I mean, that, that famous phrase, eschew eschew obfuscation. I mean, which people don't know, that means do, don't make things complicated. Mm -hmm. And, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it's, it's, it's a way of, of uh, you know, pretending that, because if you are ashamed of the true nature of yourself, of course you're going to seek to cover that up and, and create a, a, a smoke screen mm -hmm. so people can't see the real you, when mm -hmm. in fact that's the biggest value that you can get. Uh, and I found as a speaker, presenter, whatever, the, the big value is not in the content. It's not in the complexity of thought chains that I have. It's my own personal energy and having the guts to just be. And you do this. You know, you're just 
Jordan. You're not that's trying to be yeah. something else, and that's it, the big appeal. It, we're going to be talking with you throughout the night uh, various times, but one of the things has to do with the energy that people emit. We'll call it the aura. Call it the color of the, the vibration or whatever. We'll get into mm-hmm. that in just a bit. But I agree with you. I think people and organizations uh, are set up to just make things seem more complicated than they really are, and that's how they stay in business. Well, certainly, it, the more complicated, so this has to do with any bureaucracy, uh, if you're getting paid by the hour to process paper, well, the more complicated the paper is, the more job security you have. It's right. very simple math, very simple economics. Nobody wants to make things simple. Because if somebody said, oh, there's a simple way to do this, you know, well, okay, well, gee, we can fire three of you because we only need one person. To IRS do tax way. code, simple as that. You oh. take a look, it's 14,000 pages or some ridiculous amount of complicated stuff requiring a whole industry of, yes. of CPAs, cleaning, pressing, and alteration, by the way. That's what that stands for. Oh, and oh, I and see. see what I did there? Yeah. But you could eliminate all of the complications for the world or for the nation by simply saying everybody pays 10 percent go home but no it's not no, going to happen no, can't. well first of all you've got the wealthiest americans are paying a lower tax rate than the people who make less than a hundred thousand which is amazing but what bothers me is why do i have to pay 20 30 50 bucks every april 14th at midnight for some software to do my taxes i mean we got a federal government they got billions of dollars why can't you you know, instead of sending me a piece of paper, send me a disk with the software. Why, ah. why do I have to pay someone else to, you know, understand? Why can't the government do that? So that you pay someone else, and therefore they will accept that money and pay taxes on that and support the government. Maybe. I don't know. <sighs> well, it's nice that they went to college and got a degree <laughs> in accounting, so now i got to pay for that, too. Even it's, there's, the trouble is we're too, we're too productive. We have to make up make work. Because otherwise, we could have like 15 people manufacturing everything because it's all robots. You know, tonight at the uh, wedding I attended, a wonderful time, I went to take a picture with my phone, of course, welcome to mm-hmm. the world. And uh, I didn't realize that the flash was off, and I, none of us at the table could figure out how, and we all have iPhones, how to adjust the flash on the, <laughs> on the most, the easiest camera in the world, right? You just point mm-hmm. and click. So... Uh, it, it, it the old uh, Groucho Marx line, why an eight year old could figure this out quick. Find me an eight year old. Yeah. I don't know how I can't make heads or tails out of it. Exactly. It's really it's really uh, it's true more than ever. It, it's very more complicated, but it's astonishing that you have in this little device here a, a movie studio, a, a, a fabulous camera, and uh, it's mind boggling, really. We were talking tonight about the fact that thirty years ago, twenty years ago. Well, let's say 30, before cell phones were mm-hmm. so pro- pro- prolific and prominent. When you were out on the road, you didn't use a phone because you didn't have one. If you needed to make a call in an emergency, you'd pull over, stop the car, get out, go to a p- 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 pay phone. Yes. Totally foreign to anybody under the age of 30 today, probably. Yeah, they've never seen them. <laughs> I had a, fr- a friend that age post a picture of a pay phone the other day. Yeah. It was a pay phone in a, in a ladies' room. And she said, this is very strange, not to have a payphone in that. And I said, well, you know, if nature calls. But it, it, you have to return the call. <laughs> yeah, of course. There you go. But Interesting. they were not used to seeing a payphone. It is a very bizarre thing. And mm. it's, it's, mm. you know, it's obsolete technology. So this book that you're working on, and we'll have you back when it comes out so you can sell Fantastic. a few copies. This book is, is really about uh, asking the questions that people are afraid to ask and wondering why are we beset by so many experts who want to help us. But does it also deal with this idea of the aura and vibration and, and energy that people yeah. give us. Yeah, well, that's basically what the book is about. I mean, my, my article writing is, is not very popular with the improvementology industry because <laughs> I just say basically or there's, this is pointless. But uh, I just wanted to understand why some people just had this glow. That there's some people, I, have you ever, you've met people who are, oh, money just comes to them. Mm-hmm. Th- they could lose all their money and, you know, some, it would just fall into their, their lap the next day. And there's other people who work hard, they, they do follow everything by the numbers, and they get nowhere. And so this physical plane doesn't seem to really do it. And this kind of touches on an almost f- a religious, spiritual. Well, you, you mentioned element. the great John Williams, the composer, mu- yeah. movies, Oscars, and of course, uh, conductor. And he just, he, 
it just happens for it him. It just happens. And, and uh, I have a dance teacher. She talks about the essence of effortlessness. She, you don't have to work at it. If you're doing it correctly, it's effortlessness. She uses gravity to do everything, so the gravity just pulls you down the slot and makes everything happen. Mm. Uh, that was one of these people who explained the kernel to me that said, once I understood that, I understood how to dance socially. Mm -hmm. uh, but I said, is this something that's just genetic? Is it just something that's, but, because I, my, uh, you know, my book, the Rich Kid, Poor Kid book, was that, that was the original title, because I went to this poor kid school, and every day they just corroded our trust every day it was just a, you have to have a pass we don't trust you we're going to watch you all the time then i went to the rich kids mm -hmm. school and they cultivated trust every single minute so what i came up with i mean i'll jump to the the, the idea of the book is that our uh, emotional state is like the bandwidth of uh, the visible light spectrum and it's not just an emotional state it's a combination of the three three r i figured out desire uh fear energy which is complicated and trust and if you get out of balance if you have a lot of tr you, you've met people who've had trust violation experiences in their lives mm -hmm. and they never recover from it mm -hmm. now where is that energy emotion is energy therefore there must be a wave you know uh, somewhere there has to be some scientist who can draw you a wave of that bandwidth and that frequency and that amplitude and if that's the case then can we adjust our emotional bandwidth and these these channels? I mean, right now we're tr we're broadcasting on AM 1030, but you and I, and the sun and the earth are all emitting gamma rays, X rays, uh, TV rays, CB band. I mean, there's all this mm. the interference from the sun. Mm -hmm. It's all this energy flowing around. And is it possible? Because I'm trying to find the thing that does work, and this is the first thing that's worked for me. Is saying, okay, I need to adjust the dials of my uh, emotional energy balance here. So that's, that's kind of what the book is about, is, is mm. examining, taking the science we know of how energy waves work and saying, okay, let's think about the energy waves of emotions and personality. And if someone has, you know, a, a bandwidth like that, that, you know, I'm drawing a picture of kind of a, a wacky, and you've met people who, who their desire energy is very low. And, you, and, and people who emit a lot of trust energy, they just draw money to them. And it's not just money. It's also relationship. It's also yes. Yes. Uh, wanting to be in the presence of people. Certain people, that we, this is nothing new. They walk into the room and pff, the yes. room lights up. Yeah, exactly. Other people seem to wander in and, and either you don't notice them at all or they sap the energy. I was on the phone yesterday yes. with somebody who just drained me <laughs> like a, I felt like a prune or a raisin afterwards. And I mean, we all know people like that. And what's happening? What's going on oh, there? And there's another, John yeah. Bradshaw, this guy in the recovery community. I know John, yes. He I've was had him on. He's an interesting guy. Oh, great. He's a fascinating guy. This guy, you know, he, he had told me stuff that I never forgot. Uh, he talked about people from dysfunctional families. If you go, if one a person from that environment goes to a party, he said there'd be 200 people in the room. And if there's another person in that room with a similar uh, dysfunctional, you know, abusive childhood background, it's like radar. He said, mm. you, you, you'll find them immediately. This has happened to me many times where I just gravitate towards people who are on my wavelength. They are my frequency. And I said, so this is the science I'm trying to wrestle to the ground here and saying, this is, okay, maybe this are, is a little Are you easy. going to suggest, just in the research you've done, that opposites do not attract? Uh I don't know. I, certainly, <laughs> if you have a con man who has n no trust, he's going to create massive trust in response. So you may have people who are uh, kind of, if you're completely uh, unbalanced this way, you'll find a person who is the exact opposite in order to balance each other yeah, out. Yeah. That would make sense. Uh, but certainly, you are. we're all drawn to similar uh, wavelengths and energies. We, we're drawn to that. At the same time, Here's the problem is that if you're a really healthy, well-balanced person and you've got bright white sunshine, you're going to attract. Well, being attractive doesn't mean you attract good things. <laughs> it no, that means you attract. That's true. I'm talking here with Justin Locke, my good buddy, Justin Locke, L-O-C-K-E dot com. And uh, if Rodin were here and he wanted a subject for the thinker, he would use you, I think. Oh, fantastic. Put your hand underneath your, hand there, under yeah, the put your, like hand underneath like your chin and sit. 
down like Dobie Gillis. Do, do, do I have to take my clothes off? No, no, no. You can leave your clothes on. All right. Please, please leave your yeah, clothes that's, on. That's a thought we don't but want to we're, think we're about. But he's a very <laughs> interesting guy, as you can tell. And we'll talk music a little later in the show as well, because that's always fun with you. But uh, I love this idea of, of what is it that appeals to us. And there are people in the public sphere, uh, political people, talking heads, whom I agree with. And I say, rah, rah. And I wouldn't want to be in the same area code as them. I, mm-hmm. I, 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 it's just something about them just drives me crazy. It's that something about them. That's what I'm trying to You're put trying down. to figure out. What well, let's put it on a chart, and maybe we can now own that, kind of like, you know, oh, now we can fly planes. So the, what, what are the three things? Because <laughs> then if you can now – you, now you can fix things. Now you can fix things if you have that kernel of, of understanding. Boy, if you, if you come up with this – you realize that the political world will want to grab you as the number one sort of spin master, go-to guy, uh, consultant. You could elect anybody if that's the case, right? Well, that's kind of what they're doing now. Uh, if you take my premise, I mean, I'm not sure if a bit of a desire, fear, and and trust, but every single political ad is destruction of trust. Yes. Yeah. Every single one, and you can't. If you can go into a voting booth, playing on fear, and it doesn't, and you're f- afraid, you know, and. Uh, then what? It's, it's more, mostly those because fear is is really easy to increase and desire is easy to destroy. Yeah. So if you get people out of balance, now you can control them. All right. Let me go to uh, my friend Danny from Woods Hole, who's a regular contributor to the program. Hi, Danny. Hit, well, I haven't hit the button yet. Oh, okay. wait a minute. Hi, Danny. <laughs> uh, now you hit me button. There you are hitting all oh, the buttons. Well, he could hear me. Say hello to my friend you. Justin Locke, who's here. Just kind of. Hi, Danny. It's Good great evening. Great conversation. Well, thank you. Now, something that's kind of irrelevant, though, but you mentioned it. The Wicked Witch of the East. Didn't you always want to see what she looked like before she got flat? Yeah, we've never, in the movie, we, we never. We never see her. We just see her dangling feet and curly socks. Well, actually, that's my... what she must have looked like with those ruby heels. Yeah, well, slippers and those garish straight socks. Imagine the rest are really good. My question was, Dorothy, where's she? Can never wear, take the shoes off, and she's walking how many miles? Don't you need to like change your socks once in a while? You know that that, that I. I was, <laughs> you know, oh, and then at, at the end, uh, the good witch of the north says, "You could have gone home anytime you wanted." Oh, to. oh I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could have gone any time. Oh, yeah, any time. I just, I just figured you had to figure yes, it out. Yes, and then I think it's scary. Why didn't you tell her before? Oh, you had to learn it on your own. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> what are we paying you for? That's why I love Dan. He's one of my favorite callers because he he thinks the way we do. Oh, you know? yeah. Okay, Dan, I'm I'm right there yeah, with but you. But it's still it's a wonderful, a wonderful yeah. show. I think I've seen it like fifty times. Oh, it is a great movie, and, and to a certain extent, there is some people have to learn things the hard way. Oh, that's true. And so that, that's the lesson, yeah. You that is the lesson. Yeah. Some people, you got to, you know, go, and you got to face, take your belief that someone else has the power, which is Dorothy had that belief in the wizard, and she was uh, had to face her darkest fears. Mm-hmm. And when she did that, then she had the power. So there is a, a, a mythical uh, mm-hmm. legitimacy mm-hmm. to the story, mm-hmm. which makes it so timeless and popular. Now, uh, do you have a creep alarm? A building creep alarm. <laughs> a creep alarm? I think I know where he's going. You here. mean like, you know, a, a, a motion sensor for, for, for stalkers? Uh, it's just a feeling if there's uh, somebody that's a little unstable around. Oh, you know, yeah, the, the hair on the back of your <laughs> I neck did. goes An up. alarm goes off, like, mm-hmm. cook alarm, cook alarm, beware, yeah. beware. Oh, yeah, that, that's that's part of it. We, I mean, dogs sense this. They can smell fear, we used to say. Mm-hmm. And I that's want to see something a dog because I can uh, if I were, sense that somebody's sorry? not quite there, you know. <laughs> well, I think I, I think we're talking about the, the um, beautiful aura of human beings, and sometimes it's not so beautiful. And we get that sense, but we don't really put our finger on what it is no right and and sadly you see it happen all the time it's probably happened to all of us we fall into the trap and we don't want to believe our gut we don't want to believe our intuition exactly and we really should more often than not i've always tended to go with it uh, and i'm almost always right that that's a nut <laughs> mm-hmm. it's, uh, and now there's a lovely woman that's been a summer neighbor across the little street from me for it's 1960, and she's a wonderful lady, but and she just arrived yesterday for the summer, and I, even though I like 
like her. I like talking to these hormones. I still get the Twilight Zone music going. In my head. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, there's, it's amazing how you can just get a sense. And that happens in both directions. I mean, you go to a cocktail party and you see somebody that you're attracted to. It's pretty much instantaneous. It's very, that happened with conductors at Pops. We knew immediately. Mm. Never saw him before within three and, seconds. And that's so interesting you say we. Co- collectively. I mean, you're, you're talking about well, how many people in the Pops? 95. 95 people. And as a group, yeah, one or two might differ. But as it's sort of a, it's gelling or it's not gelling, oh, right? Oh, yeah, instantaneously. And yeah. it, was, it was unanimous. It was 100%. Yeah. It wow. was almost like a flock of birds. People I know, yeah. including members of my family, they don't have that danger alarm when, some, when somebody is in your hand. Oh, well, yeah, that some people trust too much. They have, you know, that that's part of growing up. I mean, even, you know, kittens and, and baby, baby lions, they have total trust. And so they'll let anybody touch them and they don't resist it. And you, and that's part of growing up is knowing who to trust and who not to trust mm. and how much. Mm-hmm. So it's I'm not. I'm very happy to have that defensive alarm. It was a blessing. Well, it can it can certainly create uh, or not create. It can prevent a lot of yes. problems down the road. Danny, I got to hold you there for time. Thank you, my friend. Okay, as yeah, always, uh, Justin, you a father? I am not. I I don't think so. <laughs> well, I know Jordan is and soon to be a grand one at that. So yes. happy Father's Day. Thank you, Daniel. Always a pleasure. And same to you, my friend. Be well. God Let's bless. You bet. Good we'll night. take t- uh, take a break. Stand by. We'll come right back and. Continuing after these words, this is the Jordan Rich Show, and by Joe, thank you for listening. Jordan Rich Show, WBZ News Radio, ten thirty. Cons- uh, constructive thought, I guess you might call it that, or uh, destructive food for thought, or whatever. A I'm getting awfully for, hungry. Are there any about diets for thought? I don't know about that. It, it, can you get information? Can you, you can, I think there is information overload. Do Your brain gets fat. Do any of them work, though? Justin yeah. Locke, L O C K E. Not John Locke. See what I did there? Mm. But certainly a modern day philosopher. I love this guy. And we're talking about a variety of things in this hour. And we'll be chatting with him throughout the night. Jeff in Salem, welcome, sir. You're on the air, Hi, Jeff. Jeff. Thanks so much. Happy to join the conversation. I'm really, really loving it. Um, my. Uh, I just want to say, you guys were talking a lot about, you know, opposites attract, similar people attract, um, and I just want to throw this into the ring here for you. I I really think it's, given that everything comes down to perspective, um, that's really all we have, and so everything we have is slanted with our own perspective. Um, What you put out when you step into the room, the kind of person that you are, colors your perception of everything else. Um, so that whole philosophy of you get what you give or life is a mirror, uh, I think holds true. Um, and when you, when you think about that, it, it really can change uh, how you move through life. I like it. You know, and then there's, yeah. a, there's what's that statement in uh, quantum physics that observing the experiment alters the experiment? Mm-hmm. And yes. So, and when yes, you walk exactly. in a room, if every single person in that room, if you think of them as an energy source— uh, and if they, for whatever, if a planet comes through another solar system, that gravity is going to affect the, the ellipse, so elliptical orbit of all the other planets. So, yes, you're going to affect everyone in the room all the time. And that's an important lesson in life to realize it, it, that well, you have that power. And not to get too spiritual here, but the butterfly effect mm-hmm. is, is kind of it comes into play here, too. You take yourself out of the equation and you're not there. You're George Bailey, uh, mm-hmm. Wonderful yep. Life. What has happened in your absence? And I think you're right, uh, Jeff, 100%. There is so much that we can do to affect how we survive in this world and thrive by just being, well, and I like to think positive, I mean, and, and, and hopeful and helpful. Oh, so. yeah. Right, or, or even appropriate to the situation. I mm-hmm. mean, you know, you're, you, you really try to put uh, a best foot forward so that, you know, if you're aware of what other people are going through uh, and you can try to put yourself uh, a little bit in their shoes, uh, you, you broaden your perspective, yeah. uh, and therefore you can be more of a positive force for change. Oh, so, absolutely. The, um, the, thank you, guys. Thank you, Jeff. A great, great, great uh, observations on your part. We appreciate it. And the empathy gene is alive and well, and that makes and, a difference. And he just changed the whole conversation here with his energy. <laughs> he did. Oh, he did. Now, when we come back, Joseph Finder, I'll be chatting with Joe for a few minutes, a great new novel called The Fixer, and then Justin and I will continue. We'll have one other guest, maybe two, throughout the night. I do want to talk to you about synesthesia, 
something that I love to talk about. I also want to talk to you about music. You're one of the most uh, incisive people when it comes to uh, the music industry, particularly classical music. So we are going to hang true. out. We're going to hang out till 3.30. How about a cup of tea? You want one or toffee or what can I get for you? Uh, do you have uh, herbal tea? I can get you anything you want. This is the Jordan Rich Show. no caffeine. No caffeine I don't it need is. It when I, you're enough caffeine for Thank me. you. We'll be back with much more. News Watch never stops. WBZ News Radio 1030. WBZ, WCCO, The Jordan Rich Show coming to you live. It's 127 Eastern Time, raining a bit in Boston, uh, to be expected. It was in the forecast, and they got it right. In studio with me uh, the rest of the way will be Justin Locke, Justin, the author of several books, including Principles of Applied Stupidity. Uh, and also, uh, we haven't talked about your your opera, the for crying out loud. The kid shows. The, the kid orchestral shows. kid shows. Let's we talk for about talk two about minutes it. about that before we take the break and get back to some other Interesting stuff. What what are you working on? What have you worked on? Oh well, the kid. Well, years. You know, I was a bass player in the Boston Pops for many years, and I used to play these kitty concerts, and we hated doing that because it was always a disaster. And uh, I, I complained about it, and somebody said, "You're so smart. Let, let's let's come up with something." You know, and so I wrote this show called Peter versus the Wolf. <laughs> and if you know Peter and the Wolf, you know there's a wolf, and he eats the duck, and they haul him to the zoo, and and well. This is the sequel to it. This is the the wolf's trial, where he claims he never ate the duck, and had, had nothing to do with this. And they call, he calls every instrument from the orchestra to the stand and cross examines them. And I wrote this kind of on a lark, and it was done locally. And then it just by total word of mouth, it started being done by orchestras all over the country. And then in '99, it it uh, went international. And a German translation was done. And this coming season, it's going to have a Hamburg premiere with the North, North German Radio Orchestra, which is a big deal. Mm -hmm. The uh, State Theater of Nuremberg is doing it again, five performances. And the uh, Concert House, the Berlin Concert House, which is, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a big deal. It's you big, go there and concert. take a bow when they ask you to. Stand. If I can, you know, scare up the money for a ticket. <laughs> Sometimes they fly me in. You know, oh, I've nice. had some great free trips on this show. It's, it's it's a lot of fun, and so I'm very proud of that. I've got a, a Viennese premieres in the works, and now. also the Phantom of the Orchestra. Is that a different piece? Uh, that's a different piece. That's about a guy. It's an autobiographical piece. It's about a guy who hates music, and he's, he he wants peace and quiet. So he teaches you about the orchestra by sabotaging it. Mm. And that's done, and there's a group in Poland that does this like five, six times a year. And that, that, that really went off internationally as well, and that's been done in Rio de Janeiro. So the purpose of it was to be a, a, a just, you know, repertoire for an orchestra to do on their annual kitty concert. And it's been kind of a fun little uh, thing for me to be done internationally. With the narration, right? Well, there's a narrator usually. And, well, I could uh, do that. Well, Why we'll don't have we do to, that? Okay, well, let's uh, call, call Keith Lockhart. Let's get him on the phone. <laughs> Is he awake? I, I <laughs> Well, he worked last night, so he might be. All right. You got his number? Let's call him up. No, I think that's great. Congratulations well, on the uh, on a, the work there. Uh, when we come back, Justin and I have talked about a lot of things. His other books, Real Men Don't Rehearse, which is terrific, and we'll get into the music world uh, and getting in touch with your inner rich kid, all of which we've spoken with you about before. You and I are going to talk about uh, some of these things we touched on in the first hour. And uh, what did you call that? What You made up another word with humility in it. What is it? Humility ectomy. Humility ectomies. We're going to explore that uh, surgical procedure, and uh, <laughs> I still want to talk to you about synesthesia and much more. You're listening to The Jordan Rich Show. We'll take a very short pause for an update from CBS and then return with much more conversation. CBS News Update. <laughs> Yes, we're back. WBZ, The Jordan Rich Show, also heard on WCCO. My guest in studio is Justin Locke. Justin's played uh, with professional orchestras, including the Boston Pops. He's a speaker, an author, a consultant to the stars, and he joins me regularly uh, just to hang out and, and chat about things. I want to get to, we have some calls coming in, but what is a uh, humil humility ectomy, a new procedure at Mass General? What is it? <laughs> Well, it's just something that uh, I discovered that the most, uh, I mean, the best musicians I ever met, I always thought when people got really good that they would be uh, brash and, and overbearing, but the exact opposite was always the case. They were very humble people, and that's really the key 
to getting better is understanding that <clears throat> I could get better, that I'm not perfect now. I need to improve. And that really opens the door to letting other people help you, you know, letting other people coach you. Whereas, you know, you know that whole saying, you can always tell a Harvard man, but you can't tell him much. <laughs> it's, it's the uh, once you get told that you're smart, and somebody says you're okay. You've been you done been graduated, and you are smart. Well, now you don't want to hear anymore because anything that comes into your realm is going to conflict with that very fragile belief that you are now smart. So, the dumber you look, the more stuff people tell you. That's one of the principles of applied stupidity, by the way. Yes. And so I have taken to just letting people. I, I pr actually pretend to not know anything, and then someone will come along and <laughs> tell me stuff. Which, if I said I'm really smart and I'm a brilliant, I'm a genius, no, no one's going to tell me anything, including my car's getting towed. Mm. You know, you're so smart, you figure mm. it out. Exactly. And if you exactly. look helpless, people will come and tell you things. I, I love it. Humiliectomy. Humility ectomy. Thank you. I, I, I think it's uh, so refreshing when people who are at the top of their game say, What can I do? How can you help me get to an even bigger plateau? And I'm not here to step on you after you do it. I'm going to thank you for it. Yep. And that marshals resources to you. Mm -hmm. just, and it's the exact opposite of thinking, well, I'm going to be overbearing and I'm going to tell the world how smart I am. But that is a denial of a shame state sense of a, uh, that you aren't good. You're, you're kind of creating a, an artificial grandiosity that Alice Miller calls that, that people <clears> who are really damaged to balance that, to get away from the truth of themselves, which is unbearable. Mm. They create an, a, an illusion of themselves being fantastic. And then the, you can't help those people until you get into that. And if you've got a lot of money, you can hire people to help create that illusion. Oh, man, can you hire people. See? Boy, are there people ready to sell. It, it, I've, I've been in the business long enough to spot um, an insecure guest, uh, particularly celebrities. And you can always tell based on the number of entourage, the number in the entourage. <laughs> if you've got more than one publicist... First of all, if you've got a publicist with you, I'm, I'm a little suspect, but mm -hmm. it's okay. But if you've got five people, an entourage of people, wow. and, and I've, you know, this mm -hmm. happened, and it, it gets to be really kind of concerning because it's like, who's, who's, how do I reach you? How do I get to you? <laughs> oh, I can't get to you? You, you have to leave because you have enough? And you're looking over my shoulder for the next guy. Mm -hmm. uh, it just, just drives me crazy, but what are you oh. going to do? Well, you know, people, th th that's where they're really at, and then they create a, a you know, barrier around themselves to protect themselves, and then they don't get, they, you don't grow. You, you end up getting pot-bound. Let me go to uh, some calls here. My guest is Justin Locke, L-O-C-K-E. His website is his name, justinlocke.com. Read about him. He's a fascinating guy, a lot of fun, and uh, very, very uh, talented, too, as a musician. We'll talk a little bit about that in the final hour. Gary King. Now, Gary, I, let me introduce him to you. Okay. Dear Hi, friend of mine, uh, former uh, Hollywood guy working in the movie industry with his whole family, doing special effects, and uh, he's one of the nicest people on the planet. So, Gary, with all that said, are you embarrassed that I am in introduced you that way? Hope not. Oh, shut. There you go. Oh, there he is. He's got <laughs> hey, humility. He'll be hey, fine. You know what? I meant to ask you last weekend when we had the TV show and you had Chuck Goldstone with us. I wanted to get an answer to a question, and I think Justin and you combined could probably uh, help with an answer. Mm -hmm. well, let's put uh, our heads about, together. <laughs> <laughs> about um, a month ago, I was out replacing a small tree in our front yard, and I was digging down in the ground, and I hit a rock. I hit a number of rocks trying to get to the root system. So I pulled these rocks out and trying to dig deeper, and this one rock I pulled out was about the size of a pineapple, weighed about 10 pounds. And when it flipped on the ground, I looked on the rock, and it had an imprint of what looked like a root system. And immediately I'm thinking, this is a fossil. Sure. Now, what would you do with a fossil like that? Uh, I'm thinking... Uh, I put out the word to a couple buddies, and one says, get it appraised. Another guy says, uh, get it insured. Another guy says, sell it. And uh, someone else says, uh, send it to the Boston Museum of Science Paleontology Department. I'm thinking about getting it cut in half 
and making bookends out of it. <laughs> I thought you were going to say you want to you know, extract the DNA and create dinosaurs or something like that. Well, well I, 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 Justin's a very smart fellow. What do you think he should do with his fossil? What should he do with a fossil? What, well, what, what do people do with fossils generally? Uh, I, I, I can't think of it. I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying to get a fossil joke out of this, and I can't find one. <laughs> Dig deep. Uh, Any, yeah, anything time. would help. Uh, I, think, I think you already answered your question. I think there are so many experts in the New England area, uh, Museum of Science, uh, the geology uh, professor at some university might be able to help you. Uh, of course, you might well, go in I and was, say, well, there's 8 million of these, get out. Yeah. You know, I was thinking with, with all of the people that you've interviewed, and with Justin's background, that there's got to be somebody out there that would say, hey, here's the perfect thing. I think the bookends would do it. <laughs> yeah, a bookend, that sounds like a good idea. Actually, I've seen, I've, he showed me a picture of this thing, and it's it's a rock, and it looks like <laughs> like like a, some kind of a neural network running throughout the rock. It's really beautiful. It's a, oh. I just sent you an email with a picture attachment. So okay. It might, might be on your phone. Gary, I'll be happy to look into this for you, seriously, off the air, and, and uh, come up with a couple of really good suggestions for you. Well, I, really I, I happen to know I, I happen any to input from anyone and everyone. Tell you what, I happen to know uh, I have a very good resource at the Museum of Science, who's uh, Paul Fontaine. I'll check in with Paul, who's one of the uh, head curators, and we'll get we'll wow. get some information. It would be for funny you. if it was a marijuana plant. Be, <laughs> that, that the plant itself got stoned. <laughs> yeah, well, we, you know, the plant itself. Also, got stoned. I've. Uh, I Thank took you. it to the school where I worked, the middle school, uh, seventh grade level, and I showed it to one of my science teachers. And he said, man, what timing. He says, we are just discussing fossils. And he had these little seashells, and he had this shark's tooth. And I pulled this rock out of this bag that I brought it in, and he just about hit the floor. Because I've just never seen anything like this. I actually was into fossils when I was a kid. The railroad beds near my house, they would use these quarried rocks. Oh, yeah. And you, you could just dig through them and find all these little animals, fossilized animals, trilobites, things like that. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but uh, well, I just love that stuff. <laughs> Excuse me. I think Gary is an example of the kind of person that we, we all hope we can be at any point in our lives curious. Oh, Curi well, shut up. I'm making uh, I'm making a point here. <laughs> curious yeah, about things. He up. loves to build things. He builds the magic of the movies, right? You made movie magic yeah, for decades. Yeah. But isn't it cool to never lose that sense of wonder about stuff? That's important. Isn't it so important? That's important. Um, yeah. I was out today at a wonderful event, or yesterday, wonderful event, at the uh, uh, State Park in Hopkinton, it was for the Mass Breast Cancer Coalition. And congratulations to all the people who came out and raised money and had a that wonderful time. Great. What a beautiful spot. I mean, just in the middle of Massachusetts, there's this amazing nature preserve. And I said to myself, I need to spend more time <laughs> in a place like this. Mm. It was great. Anyway, I, I'm just waxing here. So I think I'll, uh, I'll, I'll connect with you off air and put you in touch with uh, some of my folks over at Museum of Science, and we'll get well, this I thing sure squared away. I sure appreciate your input, man. Anytime, my friend. And I'm looking forward to the next uh, TV night, movie night. Well, I'll let you know. And uh, unfortunately, I can't make the, uh, the next event coming up. Yeah, the big event is next week. Yeah. And Justin doesn't even know. But I'll be there in Okay, great. Well, you can call in, as a matter of fact, if you want. Uh, I'll, I definitely will do that. All right, Gary. Thank Thanks you. Thanks again, man. Right, nice bye. chat. Take bye care. Bye-bye. Yeah, next, next weekend on Saturday at midnight, from midnight to one, I'm conducting uh, my first on-air unofficial wedding ceremony, meaning it's not binding, but I'm marrying, uh, quote-unquote, uh, Glenn from Brighton, one of our regular callers mm -hmm. for the last 40 years, and his girlfriend, Sue, whom I connected together. I brought them together. I'm oh, the Yenta wow. in this yeah. situation. So we're going to have a little fun. On the oh, show. it's cool when you do that. It really is. Remember Miss Vicky and Tiny Tim in yeah, 1969? Yeah. Well, just put that out of your memory. It's not going to be anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're here with Justin Locke, and we've been talking about a variety of really cool things. But, uh, you know, what, what Gary just sparked in me was, again, the sense of, of wonder and awe and curiosity about things around us. And we were talking about this last night with another guest of mine, John Dow Jr., who's a terrific f friend. And he was saying, how nice is it when you can just stop for a few minutes 
and ponder uh, things that you don't often have a chance to think about or just listen to the silence or just kind of think about the possibilities, whatever those might be? Well, we live in a world that kind of prevents us from doing that. We're constantly hurrying up. We're messing with our time. And you have to be able to slow down enough and kind of zoom in, not just visually but time-wise, and actually spread the time out and look at a very small space of time. And you can get very, very ethereal with this stuff. As a musician and somebody who's played some of the world's greatest music over the years as a bass player in a, in a symphony orchestra, um, time is everything. You have to be on time. But oh. at the same time, use the word time enough, at the same moment, you're kind of lost in time, aren't you, if it's going well? Uh, it's, wow, to explain this, you, the amount of time that you go, you, your concept of time alters significantly when you play in a symphony orchestra. Uh, it's a very zen experience. Mm. You start to relate to schools of fish or flock of birds. I was playing a Pops concert once, and we had one of these uh, uh, opera singers that, that was past their poll date. You know, she was famous <laughs> 20 years ago, but she's still out there singing. And, and you know, she was kind of like having senior moments while she's singing these opera arias. And it was out in the hatch shell. I remember this. And she just uh, got lost. She just skipped a bar in the Ooh. middle of this famous opera aria. Now she's a bar ahead of us. The entire orchestra, without any instruction, planning, rehearsal, it just went right with her. Just the, 95 people. 95 just people just said, on. oh, she's gone. We were all with her. Mm. And we just covered it. And that happened, and I, I was sort of looking around and said, did that just actually happen? Mm. There was no memo. There was no instruction. How did we – you develop this collective consciousness. And when you start to study time as we do as musicians, you start to get a sense of control of how being just – couple of thousands or hundreds of a second sooner has a completely different emotional effect mm. than being later. And in fact, that's the only difference between the Berlin Philharmonic playing Beethoven's Fifth and the Boston Symphony mm. playing Beethoven's Fifth. The exact same notes, mm -hmm. but one is a little faster, a little slower. Mm. This one delayed the B-flat a little bit. Mm. Uh, when you hear a... Uh, I was very disappointed once I heard Paul Simon performing one of my favorite songs on, that, on, his, on a record. He did it differently in the mm -hmm. show. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, that's, I wanted to hear it exactly like it was on the record. <laughs> it's the same guy, same song, but he mm -hmm. had altered the time a little bit. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, you start to get into this whole thing of, well, because you've mastered the instrument, you are no longer limited by the difficulty of finding the note. You can get it within a millisecond. So now it's like, well, do I wait or do I a little faster? And what does that, you have to get into the trust issue. I mean, Henry Mancini had this quality. You just, you're just in the moment and you all land on the note at the mm -hmm. same time without, people think of conductors, it's like, it's like it's, it's a waving a laser pointer at a cat. They think that the orchestra is kind of like, oh, the, the guy with the white stick is waving the white stick. We have to suddenly change. We're not even looking at him. Yeah. We're not. Yeah. But the human ear right. is capable of hearing the difference between 440 pulses a second and 441 pulses a second. And you can easily say, oh, well, that was out of tune. That's how sensitive this instrument is. Not not only that, it keeps us up, walking around upright. Sure. The, the and it's all associated, but all the emotional power of music is directly related to the time. Just a little slower, a little mm. later. Just the, the silences and weights just have such impact on mm. us. Uh, and it, it was fascinating to me to, to observe this. It was right. fascinating. We've got so much more to do with our friend Justin, who will be here till uh, the conclusion of this wondrous event and adventure and we will continue after a brief break and uh, in the next hour we'll be chatting with uh, one of the top uh, tech writers in the country who's written a biography and a study of one of the top dis i guess you would call them developers of science in the country and we'll do that and much more straight ahead on the jordan rich show keep your voice down your father's listening to the radio beautiful Jordan Rich Show, WBZ, WCCO. It is raining like the Dickens right now, and uh, just be careful out there if you're driving and big puddles and so forth. It'll rain like this for a while and then taper off uh, by the afternoon time. 
So happy Father's Day. Dads are not going to be playing golf or playing softball today in the New England area because it is wet as can be. I said last night, uh, Justin, I said, I hope uh, kids let the dads sleep in on a rainy Sunday morning. I don't know if they will, but it's yeah, a possibility. You know, it's a possibility. There's hope. So we're going to come back after this uh, uh, top hour thing and chat with Ashley Vance. He's a, a very well-respected uh, tech writer, they call him, uh, writing on technology, about the story of this guy, Elon Musk, which sounds like a cologne. I, I did. I it thought does. I wore, I applied that at some point. And so we'll do that. And then I want to talk with you further about uh, about the music and, and all that. Are you still playing, by the way? You still get a chance to play? I sold all my basses because if I kept one, you know, there'd be always be somebody, you know, wanting to do the Messiah in Manchester, you know. So you actually storm. sold your instruments I so did. you wouldn't be I did. tempted to go back and oh, do yeah, it. Yeah, I did. I quit the union and sold the basses. I, 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 I needed to, you know, go on with my life. I traded them in on uh, uh, West Coast Swing Dance followers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know, you don't have to pay insurance. It's just a lot more fun. But do you do you miss it on occasion? Do you ever do you ever watch a concert and say, uh, "Gee, I wish I could be up there." I don't. I I, I have. I mean, there were moments. I mean, working with Henry Mancini was was magical. Mm. But you know, that was a time in my life when I did that and I enjoyed it and it was a very interesting experience. But uh, no, I I have a folk guitar that I'm teaching myself to, to play folk guitar just for fun. And, uh, you know, it was, but no, I don't want to play the bass. Playing the bass is, there's a lot of, it, it's, it's a highly technical thing. And if you play 500 Nutcrackers, you really don't want to do it again. If you play 500, let me, just, can I quote you on that? Sure. If you play 500 <laughs> Nutcrackers, you really don't want to do it again. That, I, that should be a, your catchphrase. That, the, <laughs> there it is. I mean, I, 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 I really don't. I, I had enough. Yeah, 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 <laughs> I enough. had enough. Yeah. So. I think it's in a, in a in an orchestra. A bass is not. I mean, it's important. It's it's functional. It's very key. But it's not the sexiest instrument. No, is it? it is not. It really you 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 have a utilitarian task back there mm. to just honk out those notes as loud as you can. Mm -hmm. And you know that's your. And you don't get to play the melody. And you know it's fun to be the single bass in a uh, Broadway show and down mm. there playing the the, the the rhythm section. The, yeah, there's a wonderful tribal uh, sense of belonging that happens within an orchestra but it's like anything else I mean y you might have a wonderful family life or you, it might be hell on earth and it's it's a very demanding life uh, and you know just gigging and schlepping bases through a snow drift so I right. just, I, I just right. don't want to be doing this when I'm you worked at Broadway style shows did you do pit oh yeah work? Pit yeah, work. yeah. yeah. Shows would uh, preview in Boston before mm. going to New York, and I would occasionally be. Uh, I played Peter Pan. I played a, my one and only with Tommy Tune and Twiggy. I saw that. My uh, gosh, I saw that show when it came to town. Oh, okay. Tommy well, Tune, I was yeah. the bass player. I got Tune? to play a little duet with Honey Coles in the middle of that. That ah, was kind of a personal okay. highlight kind of thing. Interesting. Interesting. There's a story about that in Real Men Don't Rehearse. The the tub in the stage sprung a leak, and it. Leaked into the it pit. Leaked into the pit, and it just rained on this <laughs> percussionist the whole second act, and he had to play in a in a monsoon. You know, this is weird. I, uh, we can take a break here. Whenever I go to a broad a Broadway style play, or either in mm -hmm. Broadway, I always first but first thing I do is I go down to the front, I look into the pit. I want to know where those guys are. I feel <laughs> I feel I feel I need kinship with the orchestra. Oh well, that's, I like that's that. nice I of you like, to do that. I like to know where these these people are nowadays. Uh, it's interesting because you can see that there are cameras and video screens, uh, at least in the operas I've seen, and, and so the, the actors can see the conductor. conductor yeah, more. so they're backstage and they can see him yeah. and, and react yeah, to that. Yeah, pretty interesting. All right, stand by. We've got more to do on the Jordan Rich Show, which is always the case. So uh, we'll be back. WBZ, WCCO. Take care. We're back. It's the Jordan Rich Show on a Saturday night, Sunday morning. A little rainy, and uh, it'll be off and on rain through the day and tapering off in the afternoon in New England. Great to be with you. Justin Locke is in studio co-hosting tonight's program. We've touched on a lot of things, and we'll have a full hour to continue our traverse and travels through life's uh, highway, and it'll be kind of fun with you. So thanks for being here and eating my cookies. It's very nice. Thank you for the cookies. Yeah, it's always a, it's, you've got to feed people. If you're going to keep somebody here all night, I've got to definitely feed them. That's true. <laughs> so um, we were talking a little bit earlier about the music and, of course, the book Real Men Don't Rehearse, which sold a lot of copies. It has. It's Why do you ridiculous. think that's, that's hit a nerve? Why? 
I think it's just because it's funny. You know, it's it's a humorous take and it's honest. Uh, these were just stories that people used to ask me what it's like to play in the Boston Pops in a bar, you know, and I would start telling the real story, not the hoity-toity press office version of the, what I call the, the, the um, elite escapism that symphony orchestras tend to offer as their, their stock in trade. Mm. This was very much about the blue-collar world of the, you know, sweating in a tuxedo, honking out these notes while there's a spider crawling down the wall <laughs> and you, your, your, your stand partner has put his thumb over the last two bars and looking at you, not turn now, now. You these little, yeah. it, it's a workplace like any other. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, you, you tend to think, I have a friend who thinks, oh, you, you, you must have you know, been born in a conservatoire, you know, and eat ambrosia for breakfast. And no, <laughs> no, we're basically plumbers, but we, you know, we'd work with this product. And we have this kind of skill. And Well, speaking of plumbers, you brought it up, but it's not plumbers but electricians. I want to talk to you when we come back about something that's – it might sound completely uh, mundane to go from what we've been talking about to customer service. But you're finding a, a, a unique take on this. You've got a unique take on this because you're now working with folks in this area. I'm jumping from silo to silo. And I'm going from here to there with this, you know, perspective and and, and things to draw upon. I I think folks are going to find this really interesting, and everyone can relate when we come back. Oh, boy, can you relate to this? (laughs) Working with people who want their stuff done now. All right, Justin Locke is here, (laughs) and we'll do a little stuff now and come right back and continue, and lines uh, will be open to you. CBS Update right now at 2.31. CBS News Update a lot. Welcome back, dear friends. We have an hour or so of broadcast time to get together and have fun. And uh, this is Jordan, Jordan Rich Show, WBZ, WCCO. In studio with me is Justin Locke. Go to his website. You'll learn all about this fascinating gentleman, Justin, L-O-C-K-E dot com, author of several books, Getting in Touch with Your Inner Rich Kid, Principles of Applied Stupidity, and, of course, Real Men Don't Rehearse about his days as a uh, symphony orchestra pops musician. And uh, he's got several other projects in the works. He's a, a popular speaker. Before we get to calls, I mentioned I teased this a little bit. You do a little bit of work now as a as a as an administrative assistant. What what, what is the work actually? What what are you doing? Uh, yeah, I'm a glorified uh, dispatcher. Okay, you know, and management consultant. I come in a couple hours a day and help this guy run his company. And his company is electrician. He's an electrician. You know, he's got a. a, a cadre of three or four helpers mostly and you know we're looking for another guy to hire and he does houses he does individual calls and and drives all over you know with 20 mile mile radius and i knew nothing of electricity when i started this speaking of tesla oh man (laughs) oh man i knew nothing and i have to tell you i absolutely love it because i think i always wanted to be a guy in a truck doing construction trade i love working with my hands and painting and I mean, I could never really develop. They, they don't let you do those skills in school because I was always on that scholarly, you got to go to college track, so I didn't get to do shop. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to do that stuff. And now I get a chance to at least vicariously deal with hands-on running those wires. So here's the question. Yes? People always say the same thing. I'm, I call for an electrician, a plumber, a carpenter, he or she never calls me back, number one. Mm-hmm. Number two, uh, I have to wait forever for them to come out. Number mm-hmm. three, they charge a forge. I mean, it's all, it, 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 and yet they're, they're the people we need. We need them. I'm telling you, I, I, I'm telling people, don't go to college. Go learn to be an electrician. You, you, you will never be lonely. The phone rings off the hook. It rings off the hook. And actually, it's, he will never answer his own phone. And I'm astonished at the reactions of people when I call them. They are so grateful, but thank you for calling me back. And like, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm feeling bad. It took me two days to get back to you, and these people are just genuflecting to me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we ran into a backlog. I said, "Look, we can't get to you for like four weeks." Is oh, 
I'll, okay, I'll take it. You know, and, and I have to say that the power f- is delicious because mm. yeah, as a bass player, I had to take every gig and I had to, you know, genuflect every single contractor. And, uh, you know, there were people who had power. Uh, uh, and, you know, there's a lot of places where you work where you are in that position of powerlessness, of we'll get someone else. If you look at me crossways, we'll fire you and get mm. someone else. Mm. And you're constantly in that sense of, of Damocles' uh, sword hanging mm. over you. And this is a case where if we run into a problems with a customer, I just say, well, you can sit there in the cold and the dark and call <laughs> someone else. I really don't care. Mm. And, uh, oh, it's so funny. Some people call up and say, well, you know, I want you to come over and you know, do this job. And if, and if you do a good job for me, I got some other work for you. You know, like, like I'm desperate for work. And there's a lot of – here's what I've learned is that we're kind of creating this almost uh, – I won't use the, the S word, but it's a colonial kind of thing where we're expecting instantaneous service. And if you run into a problem at Amazon or something like that, there's a customer service person who will just, you know, bend over backwards and you will put up with any amount of ridiculousness from you to just be nice to you. Mm. But these guys in the trades, they're like violinists. They they know that they're good at something. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're, they are. They're, they're, they're emotionally invested in their work. They don't like it to be uh, over overmanaged. They don't like it to be critiqued. Uh, they're, and they're sensitive. They're really, their emotions, are, they really wear their hearts on their sleeves. They're very uh, well, they're, upfront people. I think I really do consider the people who do things in my home, for my home, even business artisans. I mean, I don't think of yes, them as, yes, as they are just artists. guys with tools. I think, because I can't do this. I don't have the skill sets, the knowledge. I don't want to have the knowledge. And I really, uh, you know, I appreciate it when, when they treat me fairly, that is. I mean, I really appreciate that. Yeah, well, this is, I mean, that's certainly a big part. There are people out there who are crooks and don't, don't know what they're doing and do shoddy work. And it's amazing the amount of bad wiring there is in eastern Massachusetts. <laughs> Oh, Are you talking about God. the citizenry up here or in there? Well, home? there's that too. But, okay. you know, a guy called up one day. He says, you know, I got this you know, electric heater and I turn the switch on. I get this smell of burning plastic. Not I good. Said, That's not good. How yeah. long has this been going on? Oh, five years. You get over there. Somebody had writ- written, uh, I mean, uh, had uh, run speaker wire. It's amazing how many people, they don't even, okay, do it yourself, but at least get the proper grade of wire. They're just using whatever's <laughs> handy in the house. Yeah. And, to, and oh my gosh, it's amazing they don't burn down. There's no, there's no law against you doing your own wiring. And, uh, oh, the stuff that we see, the stuff that we see is amazing. Well, again, you're, you're definitely a Renaissance man. You I go from a Middle Ages man. But yeah. <laughs> Let me go to uh, Phil in Ontario. Phil in Ontario. Yes, yes, we're up uh, in foreigners. Canada. Okay. We are. Hi there, Phil. Hi, Welcome Phil. to the program tonight. Hello, Jordan. How are you tonight? Great. Thank you, sir. Good. I've got a question for your bass player. Uh-oh. Mm-hmm. Yes, indeed. Uh, it concerns the fact that the last December... I attended a concert that was held in a church. It was uh, Handel's Messiah. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. To, pardon me? I'm sorry to hear that. Go on. <laughs> no, it was a great concert. Oh, okay. Yeah. And uh, after the uh, concert was over, when the muni- uh, musicians were packing up and everybody was leaving, I went forward and I talked to the bass player because I noticed that uh, on the end of the bass, there was a metal device that had been attached, retrofitted onto it. And I've seen these things on bases before and in, in recent years. And I asked him what this thing is, and he said it's called a machine or a C extension mm-hmm. more formally that allows the bass, the lowest note of, of the bass string, to play several extra notes lower. And my question is, have these been retrofitted onto all bases, or are any new bases that are being manufactured have these built right into them? What's with the story on those? Okay, well, just a big picture is that the lowest string on a string bass or a bass viol, and there's, we won't get into the music history, is the is the note E. Okay. And the lowest note on a cello is a C. Okay. And when Beethoven wrote his bass parts, he wrote them for cellos, and the basses just have to double that. And we could only go down to the E, and when it went down to the D, we had to jump up to an octave and you know play in unison with the cello instead of an octave below. Right. And some people took umbrage at that. Well, how can we somehow make a bass go down to a C? And so somebody said, well, what if we just make this extension that essentially makes the E string go another 9 or 10 inches longer, way up over the top of the scroll? 
Now the trouble is you've got to chop a piece of wood off of the scroll, and if this is a $75,000 Chiruti base, that's really not something you want to do. But it's something that uh, a lot of bass players, they want to play those low C notes. And so you can just, you can take any bass and have that installed on it. But most basses, new basses that are made, don't have it on it. It's a choice of the player. And usually you, you won't do it with all your basses. You might have a bass that's a jazz bass. You might have a bass that's a solo bass. Most bass players own actually more than one instrument. Uh, you leave one at the hall and one in the house and, you know, one in the car. Um, and then they're cheaper than violin, so you can do that. So that's the purpose of, of, of a, that's why we have to have that extension is to play those low notes and double the cello. That's why you call it a double bass, that you're doubling a, it's a, an octave below. And so, yeah, I, I uh, always envied people who had those. I kind of would like that, you know, there's a wonderful feeling of playing those super low notes. But uh, I, I didn't have one on my basses. But that, that's, uh, does that answer your question? That's what a machine is, and it's kind of an option to get it on your... Another option is to get a five-string bass. You know, you get a fifth string down there that's a low B, and now you can play, I, I don't know, it's kind of like, oh, I can play a half step lower than you. <laughs> but that's what a, a machine is about, and, and it's just hmm. basically making it uh, fit an octave below a cello. All right. The, the musician who's playing has got telling me about the history of the instrument. He said it was formerly owned by Ray Brown of the Oscar Peterson Trio. Oh, wow. Yeah, That's... yeah. and he, he showed me, the musician who was playing this, showed me a, a mark that had been repaired. Apparently what happened was that Ray Brown had repeatedly uh, slapped his fingers against the, the top of the, the bass when he was playing it and it damaged it, and it had to be repaired. And that this instrument is over 200 years old, mm -hmm. and the wood that's in it was used wood, which means it might be another 100 years older than that. And that got me thinking, can it be said that every instrument that you see in a symphony orchestra has a story behind it? Yep. Simple answer. <laughs> oh, oh, is that, oh is, uh, was that a question in there, or are you just making it? I'm, I'm sorry. No, that was my question. Well, that was a statement is also a question. What's your answer? Uh, well, I I instruments, my bass teacher used to say you don't own your instrument. You're the temporary caretaker of it. Right. And so I had uh, bases that I could tell you who owned it before me and who owned it before him and, and who got it. Um, I, I keep track of my bases. I know there's a guy in New York named Joe Bongiorno who has my old Italian base. And the other one, I don't know who bought that. It really wasn't mine. I, it was a loner from my teacher from Ohio. Uh, but you get very attached to these things. You get really, just, people are attached to their dogs. You, you get very attached to your violin or your bass. Yeah, you always hear about the the violin student who leaves it in the back of a cab and it's worth yeah two million dollars two million dollars <laughs> oh, oh what a what a horrible day that yeah. turns out to be and all the Stradivarius violins you have the provenance of them you can go back and who owned this and I'm always intrigued to know uh, you know who owned uh, uh, Heifetz's v violins who got those who got Fritz Kreisler's violin that wonderful movie the Red Violin you've seen that right you know I have not oh you've got a what's the matter with you I'm not much of a movie guy I'm Jesus. sorry I'll, I'm giving I'll you several give me a movies. list I'll and I'll, I'll go look it up please see that one uh, so <laughs> uh, boy you could uh, be careful because I can talk about instruments uh, to, for hours and hours just the, the craftsmanship of them and taking care of them and uh, the, the quality of and the, and the makers and the desire to get an Italian instrument, uh, the different uh, characteristics of French and German and, and American uh, instruments, uh, it's a big it's a big part of the whole culture. Is uh, and it's actually it's an interesting to note that the Boston Symphony Orchestra does not own those instruments on the stage. The sound of the orchestra is produced by instruments that are owned by the individual players. Yeah. So the sound of the orchestra today is completely different than what it was 40 years ago when it was a completely different set of instruments. Uh, I knew a guy who owned, it was Arthur Fiedler's father was a violinist in the BSO, and this guy owned Fiedler's father's violin. Uh, it was just, you know, you pull these things out, and people say, oh, I, I recognize that violin. It's, 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 a, mm. it's, it's, it's a very personal thing, especially with string instruments. Yeah, interesting. Phil, we've got to run along here, but thank you for no the call. Yeah, thanks for the question. Great, great to hear from you, my good friend. Let's go to Steve in Rockport. Steve, welcome. You're on WBZ Hi, and Steve. CCO. Steve? Uh, once again, you've been out of the ballpark. Uh, this fellow, Justin Locke, is fascinating. Oh, my goodness. You're riveting. my new best friend. This he... is riveting. Oh, best friend. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I'll tell you what you, I'm gonna, uh, you, you, you never heard from before. 
No, this is uh, your, your acumen and, and your knowledge of, of, uh, of electricity and, and now uh, rare bases in, in rare instruments. <laughs> it's just like uh, I'm falling off. I'm falling off my chair. <laughs> but I, Ray Brown, I mean, I'm going to you, Ray. Yes. About like rare instrumentation and whatnot. And the Elon Musk thing was awesome, too. Well, this is a night where we're, we're it's a little rainy, and I thought, let's talk about stuff that is never talked about on the radio <laughs> with with very smart people, and I, I, that's why Justin's oh, okay. fun to have. Yeah, I, I, I guess I should be sitting at the little kid's table on this one. No, 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 no. no. Just, you, you'd be amazed how ignorant I become after like 20 minutes, but do go on. <laughs> what does acumen mean? Oh, never mind, go on. <laughs> Uh, cumulative, cumulative, uh, whatever. All right. <laughs> I've had a couple of cocktails myself, if you know what I'm saying. Oh, bring some over for us. That's so, <laughs> nothing wrong with that. It's a Saturday night wow. and Father's Day. Wow. Why not? Flattery you know? will get you everywhere. Come yeah. visit my website. You'll enjoy my blog and stuff. I write a lot of oh, stuff there. And I, I go to Justin Locke, and I can, and I can get, and, I, and we can, we can converse. We can actually like exchange information. Oh yeah, I can get a guy over to fix the outlets. No oh, problem. <laughs> And it's an E at the end of Locke, yeah. by the way. Yeah, if you just Google Justin Locke, I own the first two pages of Google responses of my name. So there you, go. you can just zoom uh, right in there. Can you see how smart he is, Jordan? Oh, well, <laughs> he's, a, he's a very smart fellow. Uh, but, uh, but more than that, he's a very uh, affable and likable and, and easy to talk with dude off and on the that air. Guy, so. if that guy would never buy a cocktail, a beverage, or a dinner ever if I was in the room. The, the, the is this Rockport? How far is Rockport? <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, Steve. We've got to run wait, for a wait, break. Thank you, Stephen. Wait, wait, wait. Elon is Elon with an E or an I? E L O N M U S K is the name. Elon Musk, and the book is brand new. It's a, that's the title, and it's a fascinating uh, study of this dude who's doing some amazing things. So E L O N and, and Justin. Before we go quickly, uh, I've got this guy who's a near genius that needs something to do. He might be the guy you guys are looking for. Oh, oh fantastic. Well, contact him through the website. There you go. Oh, yeah. Send me an email. Thanks, Steve. Beautiful. Take care. Thank we'll you. take the Bye-bye. break. We'll come right back in just moments for more uh, just effusive flattery. Why not? It's Why great. not? It's Why great. not? We'll be right back. Okay, we're back. It's WBZ WCCO 254, and Justin Locke is my guest in studio. I'll reintroduce Justin officially right after the top of the hour, but let's go to James in Pennsylvania, who's been on the uh, hold line for a while. Thanks for holding there, James. Hi, James. Hi, how are you? Fine. How are you tonight? You're the kindest man in radio. I'm a disabled uh, practical nurse under the Social Security Act in America here, and you never demean me or put me down. You, you and your producers are very nice people. Well, that's our pleasure, and I'm sorry to keep you waiting for that long a period, that's but okay. you're very patient. So go ahead. What's on your mind tonight, James? Uh, I've seen my first lightning bug tonight. Do you have lightning bugs in, Nor- in, uh, in New England? Lightning bugs. That's very interesting you should say that. I was watching a, a program. I can't remember what it was, and, and there were fireflies and lightning. No, I don't think we do have lightning bugs up here, do we? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I see lightning bugs every August. You do? I go out into the park in Ches- Charles River every year. It's my a big deal goodness. for me. Son of a gun. That's see? Our, that's our state insect here, and our, our state fish is the rainbow trout. What state is this? Pennsylvania. Oh, Pennsylvania, so and lightning the, bugs. Hmm. And the Douglas fir is our tree, the Christmas tree. All right, let me let me test you now. I'm going to test Justin. Do you know what our state? This is Massachusetts now. I, I hope I get this right. Our state muffin. Our state muffin. muffin. Uh, Blueberry. Cranberry. Oh, I should have known that. Come on. Oh, jeez. All right. <laughs> and I think the chickadee is our state bird. A chickadee? Yes. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, is it a little chickadee? Or is or? it a chickapea out in Springfield? Oh. 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 oh, man. What else do you have for us, James? Oh, our state farm is mountain laurel, and it grows in the mountains along the, because of the brook. To, it's illegal to pick it. It's purple. Mm-hmm. Anyways, it's Father's Day. My father's deceased. And I'm 50 years old, 5 and my daddy was a coal miner, and he died from black lungs, and he was an MP in the Army, and he always provided good for me and my mom and my brother. But um, I was 
I'm going to take the Amtrak from Pittsburgh over to Philadelphia for the 4th of July, and I'm going to go see where, you know, that's where Betsy Ross is from, where she made the first American flag, her that's, little house there. That's right, uh, and, and, mm-hmm. the, and not only that, but Philadelphia must be great, 4th of July. I've never been to Philly on the 4th. Well, uh, I'm not going to go on the streets too much at night. I'm going to stay in because it's not really the safest place in the world, mm-hmm. but I'm going to see all the, the, the Liberty Bell where it's cracked and stuff like that, and I want to go... To promote Hillary Clinton being elected in because I've had to, I'm a gay man and I'm not a predator enough. I have a boyfriend; he's my age, and I, I'm tired of religion and but being persecuted with religion, especially by right wing talk show hosts. But that's not you. But anyways, it was raining cats and dogs here, and you were talking about electricity. Yes. Well, Channel 11 in Pittsburgh, they have a, what, one million watts of, on a Doppler, and it was raining. They turned it on. It was raining cats and dogs, as the queen would say. Well, that's why lightning bugs me. Like, yeah. See what I did there? Oh, lightning bugs oh me. you tied that up beautifully. All right, James. Take care, my friend. Hey, God, hey, good talk to you. Talk go, to you. Yeah. Before you go, yeah. I have a very federal last name. It's Packy. All right. We'll, yeah, I got it. We'll ship that out to you All first right. thing in the morning. Thank you very much. I, I didn't quite hear the last part. It's something about a package. Uh, I, I don't know. Are we shipping him something? Oh, I well. Don't, I don't, it doesn't matter. Oh, anyway, oh, thank okay, you, James, well. for, thank the, you, James. for the call. So yeah. when we come back, we'll have uh, a little while. I keep teasing this. I'm going to tell you more about synesthesia. I, I uh, no, seriously. So. It, there's so there's a, a, anesthesia and there's synesthesia. When I first heard about this about 10 years ago on this program, and I was introduced to this, and I had a couple of guests talk about this. Uh, I was fascinated by it. So you will be fascinated by this. I guarantee if you of all people. Well, just I, I prefer virtuous thesia. <laughs> <laughs> well, whatever, whatever thesis you, we'll make sure we come. But we'll come back and uh, chat a bit more. Great calls tonight. And, of course, you can join us at any point, 617-254-1030 or 888-929-1030. Listening on BZ and CCO, The Jordan Rich Show continues in moments.